Jones. Uh, hello everybody, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, what I'd like to do is very quickly take you through a couple of uh, what might broadly be categorised as world archaeology exhibitions that we've shown at Manchester Museum. Um, before I do that, I'll just give a very quick introduction for those of you who are not familiar with the museum and its collection. Uh, we, we began as an institution um, in the 1860s when a number of Manchester societies, uh, the Manchester Natural History Society uh, for one, Manchester Mining Society, <coughs> presented their collections to the what was then Owens College, now the University of Manchester, and I, I think we're, along with many other uh, local regional societies th they were getting into financial difficulties and needed to offload their collections on, on a nearby institution so the university accepted on condition that the collections could be used for teaching of undergraduates but the stipulation was that these collections would continue to be available to the public and so that was the beginning uh, we now count something well over four million specimens, many of them, as you'll understand, uh, being quite small insect beetles. You, you, you might get 10,000 of these, these tiny little creatures in a, in a drawer. But um, that aside, we, we do have significant collections across the board, counting everything from archaeology and indeed archery. We're one of the few institutions that has a, a sizable archery collection, for example. Every, everything from archery and archaeology right through to zoology, uh, perhaps with the exception of social history. And these collections we use uh, in two ways and our, our mission statement actually says that we, we use our collections to promote understanding between cultures. Here's a an example from a, year, a few years ago where um, colleagues in anthropology and education put together a small exhibition called Myths About Race and also about sustainability. We, we try to work towards a sustainable world by informing our visitors about the implications of uh, uh, for instance not, not recycling glass bottles or plastic and that kind of thing. And we have a very active uh, vivarium program which is doing work in uh, countries like Ecuador to, to breed uh, frogs that are in danger of becoming extinct and they, they with, with the permission of the authorities of course they, they will remove these creatures from the jungle and they'll breed them in the museum and then they will, they will return uh, specimens to the wild to, to try and strengthen the, uh, the, the species in that, in that habitat. And we do a lot of work around climate change and extinction, which uh, I'm not going to talk about today. What, what I'd like to focus on, really, because of the theme of this session, is working internationally through our archaeological collections. And obviously, being a university museum, we do have very good contacts and very good working relationships with academics across the campus. And they will often draw upon the collections, as, as I've said, for research work, but e equally their research work can offer new things to our visitors, so we, we see them reciprocally as a potential source of ideas for new exhibitions and so on. And over the last few years we've actually done a number of exhibitions that, that draw upon this work, uh, in some instances international work, and I think that Many of you, I'm sure, in this room will appreciate that what we get out of it is some, a new offer to our visitors. The academics, of course, can use this as evidence of impact of their research. We, we can count the number of visitors. And this, this data can be very useful for academics when they're reporting to their grant funders about what, what, the, uh, what the interest has been, what the relevance has been of their particular research. So. We sometimes talk about ourselves as being almost like a, like a shop window for this research that happens in the university. And I'm sure that this kind of work is of interest, as, I, as I'll show shortly, to our visitors, and that it, it does help to promote the, the profile of Manchester as a university. So I'll look now at two exhibitions. Uh, 
This is the first one, uh, an exhibition called Fragmentary Ancestors Figurines from Combland in Ghana, and this showed in the museum. It was a short temporary exhibition, it lasted about six months, and the material was lent by the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board, and as you can see, the material um, consists of uh, clay figures. I'll show some, some images shortly. The material in question comes from northern Ghana, a place called Coma land. Uh, this is so remote from the capital that Ghanaians themselves often refer to this part of Ghana as being overseas. It, it's just to them, it's just so remote. And uh, working with Professor Tim Insol, who's now um, teaching at the University of Exeter, um, we were able to access a group of fascinating uh, ceramic figurines that came from this part of Ghana. Tim had been working with the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board for a number of years and had worked with them to excavate a number of the uh, mounds in which these figurines or fragmentary figurines had been found. And uh, sadly this was, this, this should be seen alongside a, a rather sad history, which I, I'm sure will be familiar to many of us, of people going to uh, third world or developing countries and removing um, th archaeological remains and then selling them on the art market. And very often this material is sold on the basis of its art historical interest, its aesthetic values. And often the archaeological information about context which is so important in understanding the the role of these objects that that's been completely lost so from Tim's point of view from the point of view of the GMMB it was very important that there should be some attempt to record the original context from which this material is coming and again this should be seen against the backdrop of a, a, a longer term history in which the original populations who produce this material have completely disappeared because of warfare, because of disease, because of the sad history of uh, uh, slave trading in, in West Africa and uh, Central Africa. So it's very important to do this work and we, because of our role as I've said as being something of a, a, sh a shop window for research in the university, we, we're very happy to show this in the museum. But I, I hasten to add that uh, it wasn't just us, it was it very much depended on that very good working relationship that we had or were able to establish with the GMMB uh, together with Professor Tim Insall. And I, I doubt very much that we would have had the opportunity to show this material otherwise. This, is, this gives you an idea of the, 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 the looting of these sites. And this is something that villagers have, have often commented on saying that it, it's it's outsiders who, who come in or, or perhaps people in the community being tempted by offers of large sums of money or, well, what to them seem to be large sums of money, but to the people involved in this trade, it, it, these are paltry sums. And then this material is removed and is sent abroad and uh, is purchased by art collectors and so on. And very often the, um, the, these, these mounds, they, they may only be about 50 centimetres or so high above the surrounding landscape. This, um, the, these, these materials are, are plundered, leaving only the, the fragmentary pieces, which are of no interest to the, the art dealers. The, these are left behind. And of course, without their original context, they, they are much less meaningful. However, because of Tim's role and the uh, role of people from the GMMB, University of Ghana and so on, w these mounds have been investigated archaeologically, so it's been possible to recover objects actually in situ, in association with other materials, and this has thrown new light on the significance of these pieces, the way these pieces were first used by those originating communities. I should say very briefly that um, obviously when you're working internationally one of the major challenges is the cost of transport and uh, we, we work very closely with the GMMB to satisfy obviously their concerns about packaging and uh, try, trying to mitigate any, any danger of damage to these, these very interesting pieces. And uh, actually what um, we, we 
and this is something maybe may discussing question, questioning, but one, one of the things, one of the solutions that we arrived at, and this was really because we, we were unable to, to locate a shipper in Ghana to, to bring this back as a palletized uh, shipment, we actually arranged for one of our curators, our, our conserva conservators, to go out to Ghana to work with the GMMB to pack this material and for the material to go on the air aircraft as walk-on luggage. And that's not entirely ideal, but it, it, it resolved the problem. And I don't think this exhibition would have been possible otherwise. And I, I hasten to say, all that, that was um, something of a compromise. None of the pieces were damaged and the material was accompanied by a Ghanaian courier and he was there when the material was unpacked with one of our conservators in, in the Manchester Museum Conservation Lab. So this, uh, this gives you a, a, an idea of the uh, Fragmentary Ancestors exhibition at the Manchester Museum. You can see the uh, horseman uh, character who uh, I showed earlier in, in context, and we, we believe he's a horse rider. It's been suggested he might be a camel rider, but I, th I think it's more likely he's, he's riding a horse. And you see the incredible detail of these pieces. They've been dated using radiocarbon uh, dating techniques from broadly about 700 to about 1100. So it's round about our early medieval period, approaching our high medieval period. And they are incredibly detailed with the depiction of bangles, armlets, knives, um, uh, e even tattooing on the flesh of the individuals concerned. And notice this uh, umbilical, the, the projecting um, umbilical cord. This, this is something that you can s still see apparently when you go out to North Ghana, you see, see children playing in the street. Um, they, they have this, this noticeable projecting um, uh, belly button. It's, uh, it's very unusual and it's very interesting to see this on the figures themselves. So we, we showed uh, a selection of these pieces and made context of them, made, made, made sense of the, um, the, these pieces in terms of uh, ritual offerings. And in, in some cases, we were able to shed some light on the original purpose or the way in which these pieces may have been used. And um, thanks to having access uh, on campus to more uh, elaborate uh, analytical techniques, there was some DNA testing, for instance, of the materials that were in the cavities of some of the fired clay pieces. So these uh, these clay pieces here, which I, I sometimes refer to as golf tees, they, uh, they have that sort of look to them. They're, they're, they're kind of funnel shaped and they have something like um, a score mark or a, 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 a channel going down the middle. This, this is a scan x-ray showing one of them. And the contents of these, one of these channels was investigated by colleagues at the university and the, they are, through DNA analysis, this was shown to be uh, banana and pine, neither species being nat or known to have been native to Ghana at that time. So this is evidence of uh, longer term, long, uh, more, more extensive trade networks. I think this was, this was a very interesting uh, piece of analysis that obviously we could only do uh, here at Manchester. It was something obviously that we could then feed back to our colleagues, our partners at the GMMB. And what, what it looks like is that local communities were gathering together and making ritual offerings of libations using material like this. Even those more complex uh, ceramic clay figurines, the, uh, the uh, figure I showed you earlier, very often they will have cavities in the mouth or ears where it looks as though these kinds of offerings or libations could be made. And it may be some attempt to contact ancestor figures to seek their intervention, uh, for instance, the help to avert bad luck or to cope with disease. We, we can't be entirely sure, but this, this kind of work is, is it's shedding more light on the original context and the, the original use and significance of these pieces in a way that obviously by taking these pieces out of the country and selling them on the art network, that 
it, it, it's, it's telling us much more than would otherwise be the case. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Eric Narkis, in the Conservation Department then went back and the, the return leg of the project was to show the figurines at the uh, National Museum in Accra. And here you can see some of the, uh, some of the pre preparatory work uh, for that and then the display of some of the figurines, including these, what I sometimes refer to as golf tees, um, bottom right. The second exhibition I'd like to just briefly talk about is a uh, completely different part of the world, the, mid the middle of the Pacific. Um, the Manchester Museum received an offer to take on uh, the loan of a, an Easter Island statue, a Rapa Nui statue, uh, from uh, a naval expedition that went out to the Pacific in the 1860s, the HMS Topaz exhibition. This was one of two stone statues that were acquired by the British Navy and which were uh, given to the British Museum. And the, uh, the smaller one, uh, an Easter Island statue called Moai Harva, had spent some time at the Liverpool Museum and for various reasons they were unable to, to complete the full term of the loan and so the piece was offered to us and we took receipt of it and decided that we would we'd actually add to the display of the stone statue by putting on a display of material from Easter Island or Rapa Nui, but working again with another academic from the Manchester campus, uh, Professor Colin Richards. And we were able to, and I think we're very fortunate indeed, to uh, negotiate loans from British Museum, Pitt Rivers Museum, the Horniman and the World Museum to add to the material that we could show because our own collection only had about half a dozen Easter Island uh, uh, artefacts. This presented a, a major challenge in itself, uh, a, a, a 2.5 tonne stone statue coming into the building, making sure it wasn't damaged, uh, make, liaising, planning and so on with our estates department to make sure that, for instance, um, the sewer pipes and so on weren't damaged when the statue came into the museum. This, this was incredibly important um, and obviously the British Museum and, and ourselves were, were very keen to make sure that the statue uh, was installed safely and that uh, there were no mishaps on route. <laughs> So this is the, uh, the original context of that statue and what, whatever we may say about colonial uh, expropriation of material, w one of the things that we gather from contemporary accounts is that local people, certainly at this stage, didn't have any qualms about trading these stone statues with visiting ships. And there are a number of these stone statues in different museums around the world. You may say, well, what choice did the locals really have if there was a, a, a gunboat lying offshore? Um, we can debate that, but it, it looks as though from contemporary accounts, they, they certainly were very happy to, to part with the statue. And what um, Professor Richards and his colleagues have been doing over the last few years is investigating the quarries where these stone statues were produced, but in particular the quarry where the, the cylindrical uh, hat or pukau was produced at, at a quarry site called uh, Punapau. And this is it, uh, bottom centre. This is, this is actually a, a volcanic site and it, it looks as though something like a thousand cubic metres of material has been extracted from that site to produce these hats for the various statues over many years. So we put this material on display, we drew on our own collections, uh, uh, also contemporary material, and this is the exhibition, and we're very fortunate that we were able to produce with uh, the artist Christine some polystyrene uh, replica figurines that we were able to show to give people a, a better idea of what the statues might have looked like originally with the hats in situ and also the eyes which seem to have activated these statues uh, in place. Um, there's the feedback. Uh, as I'm short on time, what I'd like to do just very quickly is finish that off by saying that um, to extend this international working, one of the things that we've done uh, in literally in the last two, three months is to acquire a refugee's life jacket from the island of Lesbos. Now you may be saying, well, what, why is this archaeology? Well, um, 
a paper has actually been written or published in the Journal of Contemporary Archaeology, the most recent one by Yorgos Tirikos Ergas, called Orange Life Jackets, Materiality and Narration in Lesbos, one year after the outburst of the refugee crisis. And we saw this as a very important example of contemporary collecting as a way of establishing and, and engaging uh, local communities, diaspora communities, members of the Syrian community who, who fled their country because of the, the civil war. And through that, we've been able to establish links with, for instance, artists who are marking this tragedy uh, through their work. So here we see um, an artist at, the, at uh, Tate Modern. Uh, each of these vessels represents a Syrian who's tragically lost their lives, um, sorry, a refugee who's lost their lives crossing the Mediterranean to, uh, to come to Europe. Uh, this is uh, another piece of work in the Yorkshire Sculpture Park that was shown recently. Just to give you an idea of the, the impact this has made, this is our blog site where we feature uh, our thematic collecting uh, acquisitions and discussions. And as you can see, when that piece, the Refugees Life Jacket, came in, we got one, one of the two largest spikes in interest that we've had uh, since we began a couple of years ago. So I think there's a, there really is a market for this. There's an appetite for this kind of material. For each of those exhibitions, we had about 150,000 visitors. The life jacket is taking us arguably into an, a new area of work, um, one that we think we may be able to use to generate more interest in collections from that part of the world, from the Middle East, from Syria, and so on. Um, we, we're going to uh, follow that with great interest in the future. But I think, um, despite the challenges, world archaeology is something that's very well, very worthwhile exploring. And uh, I personally have found it uh, ex extremely rewarding. Thank you.